No matter how old we are, who we are, or where we are, we all experience it in some way or another, or multiple ways at once. That it is music. Music is a very universal thing. Deaf people can feel music through vibrations. Plants supposedly grow better when music is played for them. One of the plethora of cool things about music is while music is mostly sound and from a scientific and physical point of view is a bunch of sound waves that our brains respond to, it's not all about the sound. It's also about what the music or sound does and is. It's representation, expression, culture, stories, emotion, entertainment, a connector, and a healer to name a few. Anthropologists believe music has been around for over 40,000 years, so it must be important. Hi, I'm Tikva, and in this video we'll discuss the power of music. Have you ever heard a song that totally captured your emotions? One time, I was at a concert and one of the songs that was played there gave me an explosion of joy and encouragement. I felt like I could do anything. How is it that music connects with us so emotionally? Throughout this video, we'll talk about what music is, what emotions are, how this music brings out our emotions, and a little bit about something called music therapy. Scientifically, music is just a bunch of sound waves that have been arranged for us to listen to. What are sound waves? Sound waves are fluctuating patterns of low and high pressure air molecules that are produced by movement. Basically, music is organized sound that causes many things to happen in our brains all at once. To put it simply, sound waves vibrate parts of the inside of your ear. These vibrations get translated into electricity for the brain to process. Fun fact! Among all our senses, sound triggers the greatest surprise reaction. This could be part of why we react so emotionally to music. It's good at surprising our brains. Perhaps this is because our amygdalas, which I'll tell you about in a second, are very sensitive to sound that there's something about sound that's kind of universal and we do respond emotionally and they don't exactly know why they don't they've done quite a bit of studying on it and they're still working on it but what they have shown is that pretty much all populations have similar reactions to music research shows us that we are wired to enjoy music from from before we are born we are paying attention to music it's a thing that people are drawn towards. We know that every culture that has ever existed on this planet has music. What are emotions? Emotions are said to help us survive from an evolutionary point of view. Our ancestors probably had it a lot rougher than we do. They had to find water, which their brains rewarded them for finding when they felt happy because they finally found water. Perhaps because of those emotions, people could remember where that water was, or what wasn't safe. The limbic system is said to give us pleasure for doing things necessary to our survival, such as eating or reproducing. It is often referred to as the reward system, and is a large contributor to emotions. Music unlocks this pleasure. While emotions are complex, and it's hard to have an accurate definition of emotions in the brain, Scientists believe these structures in the brain are some of the main contributors to emotions. You have the amygdala, the brain's emotion regulation center. It also connects emotions to memories and makes some decisions such as the fight, flight, or freeze response. The amygdala senses danger. Maybe music sometimes sounds dangerous to our brains? Anyway, there's the insula, which, to put it simply, is thought to help us process self-awareness, pain, and addiction. It sometimes causes us to have a reaction of disgust. The periaqueductal gray is believed to help in learning defensive and aversive behaviors, processing and inhibiting pain, and feeling sympathy. The prefrontal cortex helps predict what might happen in the future, controlling impulses and aiding problem solving. The frontal gyrus helps generate and regulate emotions, and the hippocampus plays a major role in sorting memories. The ventral striatum is a part of the brain that processes pleasure, reward, the result of anticipation, predictions, and can play a role in addiction. It is located in a group of brain structures called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia help with 
motor movement, behavior, and emotions. The How does music bring out our emotions? During my research, I decided to find out more about how music affects our emotions by talking to some people whose job it is to unlock physical and emotional barriers people face by using music. A music therapist. Uh, my name is Carolyn Neapel. I work as a music therapist. I'm also an educator. I teach in the music therapy program in North Vancouver at Capilano University. And I also make a little bit of money uh, performing, uh, singing and, and uh, playing music live. I've always loved music and I always noticed, especially when I was performing, that people would come and talk to me afterwards and they would talk so much about how music was so impactful in their life, the kinds of emotional experiences they were having, the kinds of um, ways that music was helping them cope with the things that happened in life. And I realized um, that I'd really like to know more about how music can help people. The things that I'm really interested in are the kinds of things you mostly do with adults, like um, supporting them when they're going through, um, going to the hospital, going for different treatments. I have worked with people who have a lot of mental health and addiction issues, people who are living with HIV and AIDS, people who are living with cancer, people who have had traumatic experiences in their lives and they're doing some work now to try to kind of resolve some of that trauma. You know, if anybody is thinking, oh, I might like to be a music therapist, but I don't really know what they do. The good news is they do all kinds of things. If, if you can imagine a way that music can, can help somebody, then that is part of what music therapy can be. It's really, really varied. Since like, all humans connect to music in some way or another, you can work with anybody. It's really qu quite cool that way. Currently, I am a professor at a university teaching classes about music therapy. What music therapy is, is um, using music as a tool in therapy to help somebody achieve a non-musical goal. Um, with little children who are traumatized, perhaps we could work with them on using music to help them self-express and or to grieve properly. We have people who are going through things and sometimes grief is necessary, but very hard place to, um, to unlock inside of us. We usually start with a, some form of a welcome song. And then um, you might start with some sort of easy to participate in group activities. If it's a group, and they'll do some activities that are to whatever the goals are. About an hour long is what your session will be. So before you're done, you'll have a goodbye song. Um, when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with someone, in the kind of work that I do, it probably looks a little bit more like a counseling session in the sense that like somebody would come in, we would start to chat, but just sort of checking in on how they're doing and maybe like, what is it that brought them to come and see me? You know, like what kind of issues are going on in their life? What kind of things that they need support with? It is a program that you, you have to go to school for. You have to learn lots of different, um, what I would call like the typical things you might do with people. And it's my job to figure out how can I use music to support where this person wants to go. Sound, like processing sound in the brain is a very fast experience. Our brains are parallel processors, meaning they can process things using separate parts of the brain at the same time, unlike a computer which works in a circuit. So that's another reason why music can be so powerful. We, we process sound really, really quickly. And I guess in terms of like all of the different parts of us, you know, our body, our, our emotions, our thoughts, Boy, music just accesses all of them all at the same time. It's a pretty powerful tool and it's pretty exciting. You know, it's so flexible. You can use it so many different kinds of ways. On top of that, music is one of the only things that activates pretty much every part of our brain. Listening to music strengthens the corpus callosum. That is, the fibers that connect the two hemispheres of the brain. A strong and well-connected corpus callosum contributes to your brain being strong, very efficient and well-working. Even imagining music produces nearly identical brain activity as listening to it. The cerebellum is a small piece of brain. The cerebellum plays a major role in perceiving music as it keeps track of rhythm. 
The prefrontal cortex helps make things seem less scary, the part of the brain that mostly correlates to rational thinking. The prefrontal cortex, which also helps control our emotions, is not fully developed in a teenager's brain, causing them to think or process things more with their amygdalas. This contributes to emotions being a little more intense. Often people remember and love the songs from their youth because of this. There is something cool called entrainment. Entrainment is when your body syncs with the rhythm of the music. For example, your heartbeat and brain waves actually match the rhythm of the music. This is why, typically, if someone is listening to music with a high tempo while doing something, they might do it faster compared to if they were listening to music with a slower tempo. The heart is actually pumping in pace with the music, and blood can be pumped through the body faster or slower. When it's faster, we get more energy. Neurons in your brain oscillate with the rhythm of the music and are constantly adjusting their expectations and the cerebellum enjoys adjusting itself in these oscillations. Um, we build a lot of our, our work on in music therapy is our body's response to that beat. It's, it's outside of just emotional, it's also what we call audio spinal facilitation. And that's when our bodies line up to the beat in music and respond to that. And it can, we can perceive beat even very, very quiet beat, we can perceive it and our body can start to respond to it. That can create emotional security, having something that you can rely on. That There's not really much of a division between our emotions and our body. Well, for example, I spent five years working in the burn unit. So people are coming in with really, really bad injuries and burns are very painful. It was kind of two things, it was like, I don't want you to pay attention to the pain, I want you to pay attention to the music. But I'm using the music to kind of like also bring your whole body down a little bit to calm down. So in that sense, I was working with both, like your emotions, absolutely. But also like I'm, I'm, I'm keeping one eye on how fast their heart is beating. And I'm noticing how much, maybe like how much tension there is in their body and I'm paying attention to the effect of the music on their body as well as on their psychology and their emotions. Um, you know, and it's all kind of wrapped together, right? Because it all happens at the same time. It, it is an emotional thing for sure, but I'm also knowing that there's going to be a, a corresponding response in their body. Music processing uses the same pathways in your brain as processing pain. So when someone is experiencing pain, listening to music can actually dull that pain as it occupies those parts of the brain. Often music is a great distraction from our pain or when we're exercising. Like when Carolyn was helping people in the burn unit at the hospital, it can put us in a more positive I can mood. And we can even tend to perform better and have increased endurance when listening to music. Fun fact! Listening to music can help your brain release certain antibodies, which help our immune systems. Hormones play a key role in emotions as well as your health. A few hormones and neurotransmitters are also involved in the process of our brains hearing and processing music. The most common one is dopamine. Dopamine has many, many complex functions. Scientists aren't exactly sure what dopamine does, but they think it's involved in reward associating stimuli that gave you pleasure and developing a want to attain those pleasures as well as expectations. It's a little weird that music kind of activates the parts of our brain that are responsible for addiction. The ventral striatum and dopamine are part of what make gamblers happy when they win a bet or when a drug user takes their favorite drug. Anyway, dopamine helps to form memories of both positive and negative environmental stimuli. Perhaps it makes sense that music stimulates dopamine release because sometimes music sounds dangerous and other times it sounds quite harmless. When our brains make a prediction of what will happen next in a song and we guess right or the music surprises us, dopamine is released. Adrenaline is another hormone. It causes arousal and makes a person learn things faster or pay more attention to what they're doing. It causes us to have extra energy and to be extra alert and focused. 
This plays a role in benefiting studying and memorizing things or exercising or escaping dangerous situations. Another hormone that's stimulated by music is serotonin. Serotonin can help us stay focused and emotionally stable and occasionally works with dopamine. However, only about 10% of your body's serotonin is actually produced in the brain. The rest of it is in your digestive tract and is only obtained from what you eat. People, more specifically teens, tend to listen to music that their friends listen to. We sort of use it as a way to identify ourselves. Listening to music can also stimulate the release of a hormone or neurotransmitter called oxytocin. Though there is some debate on what it actually does, oxytocin is commonly believed to be the love and trust hormone, and it helps us bond with others. Usually calm or soothing music helps our brains secrete oxytocin. When experiencing music with other people, our cortisol or stress levels decrease. Fun fact, oxytocin is believed to reduce stress and pleasure in taking drugs. One way music affects our emotions is through our memories and experiences. Music is an accessible and very specific memory cue. When we hear music, it often causes us to have an emotional reaction, and our brains remember things better when we've been emotionally involved. This is, perhaps, related to the amygdala. Music activates your amygdala. The amygdala tags memories that are associated with an emotion as important, which helps us remember those memories. Sometimes um, music can make us cry. What we don't know is whether that's something intrinsic, you know, that we were born with, or whether it's something that we've developed based on our own experiences. What I think is that it's a bit of both. That probably has a lot to do with why we react emotionally to music, is because of our experiences. Music is like a nice workout for your brain, and it accesses basically every part of your brain. So sometimes it can help people speak by bringing back memories and waking up parts of the brain related to speaking. There was this one older lady, I'll just tell you her story. Um, let's call her Ginny. We'll call her Ginny. Um, and we'll call her daughter Denise. Ginny. Um, was nonverbal. When I went in to visit this one day, Denise was crying and said, I think my mom is, maybe this is the end. And I sang this song and I kept singing and Ginny, she just, eyes, and she, they got big and she looked at me and she looked over at Denise and she started to sing. And as soon as the song was done, she started to laugh and she said, Denise, Denise, do you remember that time when we sang that song in the car? And I used to sing the song all the time to my kids. She still, she was still around and able to come back and be in present moments because of the power of music. What it was doing was really bringing back the memories, but it was allowing Denise and Ginny to have present moments to make new memories of right here and right now that were so powerful and beautiful and that was something that though not totally the same our brains perceive music very similarly to how they perceive language maybe music often helps us with our emotions because it's like talking to another person that we can relate to or enhancing the words Similar to how we associate certain words and sounds with certain things or objects, we associate songs or musical patterns with certain things, memories, or emotions. For example, the word phone refers to the pocket-sized devices with flat screens and games we carry around with us. However, for an older person, the word phone might mean a telephone or a device that's attached to a wall and is only used for oral communication. Similarly, certain songs cause us to recall memories, and sometimes these memories are different for each person but can be similar. Think of the word phlegm. Ugh, it may bring up an unpleasant thought or image to mind. Look at how it's spelled. Similarly, a song that sounds suspenseful or possibly gross may bring up unpleasant or alarmed feelings or memories. To see this in action, I conducted a little experiment of my own. I asked people to tell me how they felt at the moment. How do you feel right now? Neutral. I feel very tired. 
listen to a song and then tell me how they felt after hearing the song. How do you feel now? I feel a little bit scared because it's going to be happening with something. I feel intrigued and like there's a mystery I should discover and definitely like it's going to have a happy ending. I also asked them if they had any thoughts or imaginations while listening to the song. Did you have any thoughts or imaginations? Something yeah. coming to me. <laughs> maybe yeah. South American dancers. imagination of a dark alley. The reactions I got were different, but most of them were somewhat similar to each other. Of course, I wasn't able to test a lot of people, so my results may not be quite as accurate or reliable. Anyway, one person said it reminded them of when they were younger and the old town they used to live in. It was interesting that nearly all my participants had a specific imagination when listening to the piece of music. Often the imaginations were similar, to a degree. Two people who weren't together during the experiment said it made them imagine being in a jungle searching for something. Two different people said they anticipated what would happen next in the song. And a number of participants said it made them curious. It's interesting because when you're watching movies and there's a soundtrack to the movie, like you'll listen, you don't even necessarily pay attention to the fact that there's music playing while you're watching it. You know, because they're using music to enhance our emotional response to whatever's happening. If there was no music whatsoever, I believe we wouldn't get nearly as frightened in scary movies. I don't think we'd be nearly as emotionally lifted when people kiss or, you know, whatever, because the music actually creates a mood. I don't think there's anything not much anyway, um, in our life that's meaningful to us that isn't also somehow using music in our life. Think about the fact that many of us go to church. Music is a part of our worship. Other events like weddings, but there was music there to, to sort of enhance that experience or commemorate it. Funerals, funerals always use music and those are a very important part of our life because it's our way that we celebrate and um, honor our loved one who's gone. So music is part of socializing. As babies, our brains are open to many types of music, and we usually don't prefer one over the other. Sometimes infants don't even like music that much. But as we grow older, around the age of five, we tend to form expectations of what music from specific groups will present and contain. This is called schema. We develop schemas for rhythms, genres, styles, eras, lengths of songs, and chord progressions that are typical of the music we normally listen to. A major part of why we love some songs is that they tend to defy our expectations or schemas. For example, we like to think that a song or musical phrase will end on the note it started at, aka come back home. But if a song doesn't do that, it adds emotion, perhaps tension or curiosity. I like to say, musicians are magicians. Just like magicians, musicians create expectations. They create repeating patterns of musical phrases. They manipulate our schemas and then violate those expectations or slightly change a phrase, sometimes causing us to feel confused, surprised, or amazed. Magicians call it a magic trick. But in music, it's a musical trick on the brain. A steady pulse creates a sense of reliability and okayness or safety. Typically, if a song is slower, it's perceived as sad or calm. Whereas if a song is fast, it's perceived as exciting and happy. An emotional song might include some sort of swelling and contracting, speeding up and slowing down, or a pause to reflect. A song that makes you feel you can trust it and be vulnerable often causes a person to have emotions during the song. Sometimes this is done when a songwriter writes lyrics that one can relate to, or they are vulnerable about an experience 
they had in their song and the listener feels they should be vulnerable back. If you listen to sad music when you're sad, do you think that's weird? Well, actually, when a person is listening to music that relates to them or understands them, it makes them feel better. When we're experiencing negative emotions like sadness or confusion, we typically feel like no one understands us and we tend to feel quite lonely. However, if there's a song that has lyrics or just the music expresses your emotions perfectly, we tend to feel like someone does understand us and that makes us feel better. One of the things I think makes a great song is when the songwriter gives you a little bit of the story, but not the whole story. Because then when you're listening to the song, you can imagine yourself in the song. I have always thought of music as a connective tissue. You know, inside your body, you have bones and you have organs and you have, um, you know, sort of solid things. But you also have a lot of connective tissue that holds it all together. Music holds us together. It, it, it gives us kind of a way to be with each other, like to have a shared experience. I think about like when you go to a really good concert and the music puts you in such a good mood that you feel like you're friends with all of these strangers who are sitting around you because you all like the same kind of music. We are all human. Like we are all walking around on this planet trying to figure out how to have safe, happy lives, how to navigate the things that are hard and celebrate the things that are good. And it's not easy, but we're all trying and we get confused and we think sometimes that we are more dissimilar than similar. I personally think we're wrong about that. I think we have a lot more in common than we realize. And I think music is kind of one of the ways that reminds us. It's kind of a shared experience. When, when I hear a songwriter singing about their personal experience, but I totally get it, I totally understand, and I feel like I've had that experience too. You know, that's more of that connective tissue. It's like, yeah, that person had that experience. I've had a similar experience. I feel comforted, I feel supported by hearing them singing about that experience. Like in my job, I mean, all I do is, you know, sort of try to make connections with people. Sometimes to support them through really, really hard things. Often to remind them that they're not alone. We can feel really alone sometimes. And I think music is kind of one of the answers to helping us not feel so alone. If you want to listen to music to boost your mood, try choosing something you like. It's harder for your brain to be happy when you aren't. Many people have very different musical preferences, so it's okay if it's not something other people prefer. If you're trying to calm down or relax, you might find a song with a slower tempo or speed more helpful. If you're looking for music to help you focus, try choosing something without lyrics, so the lyrics don't distract you and aren't competing with your homework for attention. Again, try to choose music that you enjoy. Research shows that often classical music is best for studying, but you might also want to try nature sounds, meditation, or soundtrack music if classical music isn't really your thing. While music produces many benefits for us, it can sometimes not be quite as healthy as we would like. When music is too loud, above 95 decibels, it can slow our physical and mental reaction times by 20%. And of course, anything too loud can damage your ears. Is it, is it healthy to listen to songs that make you feel sad or make you feel angry? Yes, if it's a good, if it's a good opportunity to feel those feelings and, they, and you need that. If you have a piece of music that when you're listening to it, it kind of gives you permission to feel all of your feelings, I think that's fabulous. You know, I've experienced it myself. You know, when I had a, my boyfriend um, break up with me when I was a senior in high school and I thought my world was over, you know, and I went and I, I listened, I had two songs and I'd pop them in and I'd listen and I'd cry. And I, I didn't want to tell anybody I was doing that because I thought it seemed so, um, so sappy and ridiculous and I wanted to seem stronger. I didn't want anybody to know that about me. And then, 
when I started studying music therapy, I was like, oh, I didn't even know that I was like prescribing music for myself to make me cry so that I could help myself grieve. You know, it really had that effect on me and it was very useful. I already kind of self-medicate with music. You know, when I need to clean the house, I put on music with a really driving beat and it helps me get motivated to just get up and move around, you know, and maybe I will actually, you know, sort that pile finally. So there's something really lovely about how music can help us kind of like connect to who we are, but also um, help us kind of express who we are. I think sometimes in our world, we are encouraged not to express negative emotions or maybe like intense emotions. They're really normal feelings. They're actually a part of who we are. They're, they're actually incredibly important to who we are, but it's hard to find places where it feels safe to express those emotions. I think of them as like a three or four minute excuse to feel your feelings. You know, you get permission to feel sad. You get permission to feel angry. You get permission to feel like amazing and really excited. And then when the song ends, you can kind of like let that feeling go. Sometimes music can kind of keep us stuck in a feeling. So if you're out there just listening to stuff and it's causing you to have excessive emotions, and if those emotions are causing a person to want to behave either self-harm or harming others, then I'm going to say that, of course, that's not safe. So that's a that's a weighted question, if that makes sense. Like, I think the typical healthy individual can afford to listen to music that makes them feel all kinds of ways, and it's not unsafe or unhealthy. So if you're really, really down about something, you're really sad about something, and you keep listening to songs that reinforce that feeling and kind of keep you feeling sad. Is that good for you? I don't know. Maybe you need a break from feeling sad. I think each person kind of has to figure that out for themselves. I wish that we could give ourselves permission to know that we don't have to stay in our feelings for a really long time. Music can manipulate our feelings. And we should really know that because then we can make choices about what we listen to. I think that we can support each other by not forcing our own viewpoint on each other about, you know, what is beautiful in music because it's very subjective. Fun fact, listening to music can change the way you perceive things. If you hear a pleasant, happier sounding song, it can cause you to be in a happier mood. If you're in a happy mood, you tend to see things around you in a happier, more grateful, more satisfying way. These are just some of the incredible primary facts and effects of music on your mood. There are so many secondhand effects of music that might blow your mind. People are finding out more and more ways music affects our brains, bodies, plants, animals, and much more. And most of it is connected to how we feel when we hear it.